Bill Overholt and uh, Dinda Elliott, as well as truly the real star of this program is uh, Mark Brady, our events coordinator. Uh, it's really been a fantastic uh, year in this series. I hope uh, for those of you who are here uh, with us in person, uh, you have enjoyed having the chance to interact uh, live with our speakers. And for those of you who are joining us online, and I know there are many of you every week, uh, I hope uh, you've also enjoyed having the chance to continue one of the benefits and learnings from what we learned over the pandemic of making sure that this series is broadcast to a wider audience. Uh, so could everyone please first just join me in a uh, round of applause, uh, especially uh, to Mark Brady and others who made this series happen this afternoon. Um, I also want to take a moment today just to acknowledge that today's program is um, co-sponsored uh, through the generous sponsorship of the program on U.S.-Japan relations based here at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. Um, the executive director of the program uh, is here with us today, and we're honored also to have our discussant uh, be someone who's affiliated with uh, that program, as well as uh, with the Asia Center. Um, uh, this is an issue, of course, that touches on uh, China and its relations with uh, everyone else um, in Asia. And we're absolutely delighted to have um, our colleagues uh, from the program on U.S.-Japan relations and from the Asia Center to be here with us today. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce uh, today's uh, speaker uh, is Isaac Hardin. Um, he is uh, not a stranger to many of you. Uh, he is a non-resident associate affiliated with the Fairbanks Center here at Harvard, so we're very glad to welcome you back, Isaac. Um, Isaac was also a fellow in the China and the World program, uh, which, as many of you know, is uh, co-sponsored uh, with Harvard and Columbia. Um, so it's a real pleasure um, to uh, have you back here uh, with us uh, at the Fairbanks Center. Um, Isaac is currently a senior fellow for China Studies um, at the Carnegie uh, Endowment, uh, as well as a former assistant professor uh, at the U.S. Naval War College. Um, he is an author of a leading book um, entitled China's Law of the Sea, which just recently came out, um, which is uh, making a lot of waves, and I say that no pun intended, uh, in terms of um, in terms of uh, highlighting uh, China's uh, maritime power and China's naval strategy. Um, and we're uh, honored and delighted and privileged to have as a discussant today, um, Ikeda Kiros. Um, Ikeda-san is a senior fellow at the Asia Center. Um, uh, he is also a former vice admiral with the Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force. Um, he has served um, as a senior advisor to the National uh, National Security Secretariat in Japan. Um, he also has served as an advisor uh, to Fujitsu, and he uh, has, uh, in his former military capacity, uh, operated as the commanding officer uh, for parts of the Japan uh, Maritime SDF fleet um, in the Western Pacific. So certainly uh, it will be very interesting to have his comments here today to reflect on um, Isaac's uh, views on China's maritime power. So uh, without any further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, both uh, Isaac Carbon and Ikeda Tukuhiro um, to uh, our program. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mark, for that really very kind and too generous introduction. I just hope my wife tuned in. She think, thinks that this is an obscure book that should just be kind of pushed off to see. I'm, I'm giving her a hard time. She's very supportive, but it's very, it's really wonderful to hear uh, those kind words. And it's really lovely to be back here in Cambridge. Uh, I was, I last spoke in this series when Ezra Vogel invited me in 2019. And it's always been deeply meaningful to me uh, to participate in this really wonderful community of China and Asia scholars uh, here in Cambridge. So um, thank you so much also to Dinda and to Mark. Really, everything about this has been has been wonderful to include finding a, a, a most distinguished and 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 wildly overqualified uh, discussant uh, who I'm sure will correct me on, on all the the uh, the naval strategic matters that I misunderstand as a, as a civilian. But I hope to put uh, our our interest in conversation here and I tried to tee up 
a discussion about something that I cover quite extensively in my book, which I certainly encourage you to, to get a hold of, but I want to talk about it in, in different terms and really wrestle with this idea of what is China's maritime power uh, and what does it mean for the law of the sea, thus the title. And this is a illustration of a broader phenomenon, I think, which is what is China's effect on the rules of international order? What are the consequences of China's much increased power and influence and capacity to do things like change the rules or shape the way international law is applied? Uh, and so I've specialized in these maritime issues. I've had a really privileged chance to spend quite a lot of time down the road in, in Newport at the Naval War College getting to understand what this looks like from an operational and a strategic uh, perspective, both legal and uh, and naval. And I guess what I'd like to do first is just tell you what I mean by China's maritime power, offer some ideas about how that affects things like the law of the sea, uh, and then go on to thinking about what what we can say about the 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 effects on maritime order as we know it, on, on East Asian security even, at that level of, of uh, kind of uh, grandiosity even, because the, the, the real question is, what is the what are the basic agreed to rules, norms, principles about how states conduct themselves in the maritime domain in East Asia? And that'll be the, the, the end of this intro, but the bottom line up front is I think that what we see in terms of effects from China's maritime power are most concentrated for some obvious and maybe also some not so obvious reasons in East Asia. And I think thinking of East Asia as, as having its own distinctive maritime order is one of the consequences of China's maritime power. So when I say maritime power, I'm actually not primarily talking about the People's Liberation Army Navy. That is the naval uh, service in the, in the PLA, the People's Liberation Army. And it certainly and appropriately gets a lot of attention uh, as a very quickly growing and modernizing it and increasingly capable blue water force. Um, but when Chinese leadership talks about maritime power, which the senior most leaders have been doing since around the turn of the century, Jiang Zemin was the first to talk about China having a, a, a basic strategic necessity of developing maritime power. What he means, and it's been specified over the years since then, is a an integrated or a holistic type of maritime power. It's actually something that's familiar to those of you who, who study uh, naval history. It's it's familiar as a kind of Mahanian view. Alfred Thayer Mahan, a former president of the Naval War College, thought about the the holistic or the integral relationship between your merchant fleet and your your economic access to markets and resources and your naval power. The necessity of having it, and I think that at least that integrated component of it has been quite influential in terms of China's thinking about how it can best manage its own security, how it can best see to its own economic welfare. Um, so the components of it have now been specified. Xi Jinping, when he came to power in 2012, articulated uh, at several different junctures, including at a, at a high level Politburo Central Committee meeting where he gave a speech on maritime power and China's maritime rights and interests. Uh, they've specified what they mean by maritime power, and, the, and they're actually not in any particular order, but I'll order them uh, for, for my rhetorical purposes here. One of them is marine and science technology. Uh, you may be familiar with seeing Chinese uh, submersibles, deep sea diving scientific vessels, setting world records for going to the deepest depths of the deepest troughs in the ocean. That's just one illustration of many, many, many things that China has invested in over the long term in this space that they consider to be a key component of maritime power. And as the Admiral will know better than I, there is a very clear military dual use to scientific research about things like the deep seabed and bathymetry and oceanography and things that are necessary for undersea warfare or for resource exploration, uh, which is another component of this maritime power. It's China wants to be a strong maritime economic power. They call it the blue economy now in one of the many turns of branding that, that that this policy has gone through. But basically, this is things like fishing. This is things like oil and gas development, which has been quite, uh, both of which have been arguably the most acute issues in the, in the maritime disputes that we're all uh, going to get more familiar with uh, in the course of our conversation. Um, it also includes things like ports and shipping and shipbuilding. Uh, the whole marine industry, all of these 
sort of necessary components of China's economic and social model, ultimately, are consolidated in this idea of maritime power. China needs, in order to control its own destiny, to control its own access to the global economy, it needs to build maritime power along the lines of what they think the Americans did around the turn of last century, or how many centuries ago is that now? 19th to the 20th century. Um, so those are, the, those are the first two, marine science and technology, maritime industries, the blue economy. You also have this quite interesting element, which is marine environmental conservation. Uh, I won't dwell on this too long other than to say the maritime domain is tremendously consequential for the global, uh, any global ecosystem that you can think of and for all of our survival. Uh, it's something that China has devoted quite a bit of its science and technology energy towards, uh, and it's something I'm interested in learning more about. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave that alone for now just as an illustration of there's quite a range of things that are in this bucket of, of maritime power as spoken about by the central leadership of, of China. The final one, and the one that I think we'll probably focus on here is that in order to be a maritime power, China must be able to protect, it's usually Baohu, to protect its maritime rights and interests. And this is this is the China Studies Group, so I think it's worth just jumping into that, the word a little bit, maritime rights and interests, ayang quan yi. It's a conjunction of two different words that we're familiar with, quan li, like a legal right, uh, and li yi, like interest, profit. Or benefit your 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 political interest in a way your strategic interest, but the word is conjunct. It's used in many other contexts. I'm sure other students of Chinese politics here have seen this in the context of of, of women's rights and interests in China, which has been a discourse, or any number of different subjects that are not uh, you know associated with with strategic maritime space. But in this case, when China talks about maritime power and protecting rights and interests, what that means is developing the state capacity and apparatus to include the physical vessels and the, the sensors and the ability to see what's going on in the maritime domain and to assert what China views as rights that are occurring to it due to its sovereignty. Uh, and I'm going to return to sovereignty, which really is the, the big kind of unifying theme when we start to look at how is China approaching these rules? What is, what is, the, what is the, the touchstone and the center line uh, and center lines are quite an interesting subject in their own right. I'll tell you about this cryptic map eventually, uh, and actually rather quickly because I want to want to have a broad discussion. Um, so these maritime rights and interests and what China has done to protect them is really the, the substance of what I want us to get into. And as I said, the PLA Navy is not really the main instrument of this policy. They are quite important for it. They backstop or underwrite the whole affair, the idea of the PLA Navy hovering over the horizon, uh, visible or not, uh, they can shoot a long way, they can see a long way. They're part of this overall strategic picture. But the people actually doing the work are civilians. These are people in the China Coast Guard, which is actually paramilitary. We could argue about whether they're civilians, but it's nominally civilian. It's a white hull, not a gray hull, as they say, a naval hull. Um, there are many, many forms of maritime law enforcement, fisheries law enforcement, maritime traffic safety, all sorts of different roles that China now, as it has in so many other fields, has scaled up to an extraordinary degree. They have by far the biggest Coast Guard, they have by far the biggest maritime law enforcement force. The fisheries fleet, some portion of which has in fact been deputized to do certain military missions as a militia, but the vast scale of the fishing fleet is a big piece of this as well. They're out there as they often say, manifesting China's sovereignty by fishing in disputed areas, by asserting that the relationship between the Chinese fishing and the Coast Guard is part of this. Chinese Coast Guard is enforcing Chinese domestic laws about fisheries against Chinese boats in disputed waters. This is what they mean when they're talking about protecting and defending maritime rights and interests. They're integrating and pulling into China's domestic law, effectively, uh, some of these issues that at least from a U.S. perspective, and I believe in most cases from a Japanese perspective, things that by law ought to be regulated by the law of the sea, international law. So I'll move on to that now that we've got a sense of uh, maritime power, and i will be mindful of time, Mark, so please glare at me if we're going longer than you want me to. But I, I want to make just two more uh, kind of broad comments. So the first has to do with the, the law of the sea. Uh, and this map, and for those of you who are familiar with Law of the Sea maps, this, this will not look like one you've seen before. This is one that I commissioned in order to demonstrate the best we can say about what the PRC has claimed in practice in a way that you can observe 
Uh, and I, the, the book goes into some detail about what's the you know, scope conditions for defining it. But basically, each of these uh, figures reflects uh, either a definite claim. So, for example, the, the, the bold double line, the territorial sea baselines, China has formally declared part of its baselines, most of it covering the whole coast, except stopping up there uh, as it gets into the Yellow Sea, because as you'll discover, China has no settled maritime boundaries. So everything beyond those lines, everything out into the ocean is, it's not that it's anybody's guess, but it is undelimited. There is no maritime boundary that anybody has agreed to anywhere along China's maritime periphery with the sole exception of this little line right here, which you'll see is solid, which China and Vietnam were able to negotiate over the course of the 1990s and signed a treaty in 2004, or ratified it rather in 2004. Uh, other than that, this entire area, the East Asian littoral, where China borders uh, North and South Korea, Japan, Taiwan, of course, which is a big part of this maritime story, which I'm sure we will talk about, uh, Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, Indonesia, importantly, and Vietnam, maybe most consequentially, because Vietnam is the one state with whom China has routinely gone to battle with over its maritime claims. 1974, China, uh, Chinese forces, naval forces took the rest of the Paracel Islands up here. The only islands where China has baselines, where they've described actually what their claim is. And then in 1988, they see several features in the Spratly Islands there. The Spratlys are the most complicated and confusing part of this map. And any map you see of the Spratlys that purports to show the boundaries uh, or the, the possible boundaries is, is inevitably going to be a tangled mess of some sort. Uh, this one is particularly uh, tangled in the sense that what I've done is read very carefully and parsed very carefully and discussed in great detail with many Chinese colleagues, which I used to be able to do with, with uh with reckless abandon in, in the early in the early days of this research, spending a lot of time in Hainan, but now it is, it's quite quite uh, more narrowly constrained. But basically, China has said that its policy, its version of the rules, is that you can draw a straight line around island groups. They'll call them Chundao archipelagos, which is a whole other problematic discussion we can have uh, if we really want to get in the weeds. But the simple thing to know is that China's interpretation of the law of the sea this international body of law that's both captured in very substantial part in, in a treaty codified in the law of the sea, unclossed UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, but also a large body of customary law that's evolved since the Roman Empire. It's really arguably one of the oldest kind of proto bodies of international law. What China is saying is that they have a very specific interpretation of what those rules do and don't allow. And it's quite a bit different, certainly than the United States. It's an open question as to how, just how different it is from various other states in Asia. I'd be happy to have that discussion. Uh, but ultimately, the, the kind of big effect, as I said, is a regional effect. And I think what you can see from this in terms of China's maritime power and how it influences the law of the sea is that states all along this littoral, Japan especially, and, and I hope we'll discuss that in some detail, have very truncated rights under the law of the sea. If we we're to if we we're to accept the Chinese version of the rules, if we we're to accept that you can fence in some things that are not by anybody's reckoning islands, things that have been built up from sand and yeah. reefs on the on the ocean floor or little atolls that nobody's lived down. But you can fence them all in and then you can project out from those islands vast zones where you have some type of sovereign rights and jurisdiction. This is an important distinction. We're going to get, I'll, I'll get to sovereignty now and, and then kind of have the discussion because ultimately what we can think about here as far as China's relationship to the law of the sea regime that uh, is supposed to regulate this space and that is supposed to afford Japan something comparable to this 200 nautical mile kind of arcs coming out of mainland coastline in Japan's case, like the major islands, as well as the uh, islands that are sufficiently large are populated and support economic life of their own, such that they should rate exclusive economic zones for fisheries, oil and gas, et cetera, and all the way on down. And one thing you can tell with just sort of a crude, crude ruler or crudely eyeballing is that 
this whole littoral area is just all crowded on top of one another. And China's at the biggest disadvantage in that regard. China's the one in the inside. Uh, under, in law of the sea terms, this is called a zone lock. Necessarily, China must go through some other state's jurisdictional zone in order to reach the high seas. Uh, unless, of course, there's a little high seas corridor in the middle of the South China Sea, which is one possibility. Uh, if we didn't accept the Chinese version of the rules, which says these tiny little islands, several of which, the ones I've highlighted here, Subi, Fiery Cross, Mischief, now are quite substantial naval and Coast Guard facilities, um, that these are all actually projecting big zones that the Philippines, Malaysia, Indonesia, et cetera, need to, need to negotiate with China. And this is a very maximal, I think we can interpret it perfectly well as a bargaining posture. They don't actually expect that this map of East Asia would ever be accepted. Um, and I think that's, the, that's sort of a key thing that I've learned wrestling with this for a long time is that our tendency to think about international law as something necessarily universal in, in some way, think about something like the law of the sea as needing to apply uniformly, universally, consistently in some, in some orderly way that's, that's consistent with a, a, an American or a European or a, a, a liberal in some ways view of the law. And recognizing that what China is effectively saying about that type of law is that they, they're not rejecting the law of the sea. I guess it's worth noting, China has ratified the law of the sea. The United States has not. Uh, several other states uh, who think of themselves as, as, as law-abiding, uh, you know, international legal good citizens also have not. It's not, that in itself is not so outrageous, other than to say China is posturing very deliberately to say, we are the ones upholding the law of the sea. This is why I view this case as being so interesting. And I think it tells us something about the nature of China's relationship to international law and specifically the relationship between Chinese sovereignty and whether and when international law can make demands on that sovereign. And I think what we see, and we can go into detail on any of the individual claims here, is that basically at every juncture, China's not applying a consistent rule that we could identify for most of the, these issues. They're applying the principle that the sovereign, the coastal state, in the case of the law of the sea, basically has discretion to interpret the rules as they see fit. And they always come back to that argument. And if you read their argumentation during the Philippines arbitration, which was something that I've been very, very focused on for a long time, I was in China as it was launched and as the, their whole international law, international relations and government apparatus kind of geared up to engage that case. These types of uh, these types of legal restrictions on China's sovereign discretion on its authority are anathema to the leadership for reasons that I think are, are, are somewhat self-evident, but that in practice manifest in some very interesting ways in what I call China's law of the sea. What that means is there is a, there is a part of the world, this East Asian maritime region, where it's not so much that China is making the rules. Other states in the region, as we'll hear from the Admiral, I'd like to turn over to right after this, other states in the region by no means are accepting China's version of the rule. And that's sort of a necessary threshold for us to say, oh, this is becoming a, a rule that could be recognized as law, whether customary or as a valid interpretation of the treaty, the law of the sea treaty. But the reality is with, with very few exceptions, and I know some exceptions, is because these other states are effectively being denied their rights under international law, they don't acquiesce, they don't necessarily challenge China because of its power. They don't do it directly. The Philippines challenged them quite directly in an arbitration. Vietnam has clashed quite directly and been on the, the losing end of those conflicts. And it's quite a sobering prospect to go up against this China now. And so I think what we can say is that these are this is an area where China is not making the rules, but they're making the rules less effective. It's much harder for other states to have recourse to their rights under the law of the sea if China is with its power effectively saying this is the right interpretation. Uh, and I think there are a couple areas where we can see them having some effect, especially on dispute resolution. I'll leave that out there. But I, I'd like to turn it over now and hear from the Admiral and uh, we'll certainly be happy to discuss any of the, I pulled up the map here that also shows some of the naval incidents. This is one of many facets of this research, but the strategic space here is quite consequential, especially for Japan. So I will uh, resign my post here. Thank you, sir.
You'd like this or that? Yes. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to the event. Uh, uh, so, thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, presentation. Yes, I, I have found that uh, looking at China's maritime expansion uh, from the uh, perspective of the law with the sea uh, is it increasing the complex. So there. I, I do uh, mean that uh, uh, I I bought the uh, and I I read the uh, a part of the book. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You're kind. <laughs> <laughs> I I do mean mean that China's customary trains which differ from the uncross, so may take root in a different way than the interpretation of the international law. In your book, you stated. Uh, rather than ch changing the rules, uh, China is changing the international environment in which those rules take effect. Uh, I agree with this point. One of consistent principles of China's leaders' approach to international law is uh, legal disputes are not necessarily uh, dissolved by legal procedure which uh, lead to the points that you analyze. Uh, in this light, we have uh, laid for, uh, reaffirmed that the issue of midline between the EEZ and continental shape between Japan and China and the current situation surrounding the Senkaku Island is a very difficult challenge. I'll point to it so people where are we at? Yeah. The Chinese call them Diaoyu, and this is, a, again, China's projected map, but Senkaku. Yes, thank you, Marie. Sure. Uh, today, I would like to briefly introduce what the Japanese Maritime Self Defense Force is conducting in the East China Sea and the South China Sea. In the spring of 2012, the Maritime Self Defense Force changed the guideline for C4ISR operation from passive surveillance to the active surveillance. Until then, every time a Chinese naval vessel entered the East China Sea, the JMSD vessel was assigned it to the surveillance mission. This approach has being modified to deploy several destroyers in the East China Sea for a predetermined period of time, rather than acting in response to the deployment of the Chinese vessel. The first task of the mission is to collect information on Chinese naval vessels. The second is to clearly show the order of open and stable oceans based on the anchors. <clears throat> in addition to this disseminating the principle of freedom on the high sea, Japan is also the revelation of common, common sense, the use of sea by changing the response of the each sea area in activity in Japan's EEZ, Chinese continental shelf, and near the middle of them. Uh, next, I will explain the situation around the Senkaku Island. Around 2012, the Chinese Navy had been active to embody the 2A280 strategy. Under such circumstances, when the Japanese, Japanese government purchased the three islands of Senkaku and acquired the ownership, ownership so-called Declaration of Nationalization, Nationalization of Senkaku in September 2012. The Chinese Coast Guard and the PLA Navy, Navy activity increased sharply. Around the Senkaku Island, 
the Japan Coast Guard and the China Coast Guard always face each other. And in the East China Sea, the Japanese maritime ship defense force in the sea and the Chinese naval ship face each other. This situation has continued for more than 10 years. According to 2022 Defense of Japan published, published by Minister, Ministry of Defense, the activity of the China Coast Guard vessel confirmed in the contingency zone around the Senkaku Island in 2021 was 332 days, and the number of active vessels was 1,222. Both of these levels are as high as ever. Uh, here is an introduction to the relationship between Japan Coast Guard and Japan Maritime Safety Defense Force. According to Article 25 of the Coast Guard law, the Japan Coast Guard must not engage in activity, including training as military organization. On the other hand, Article 80 of the Safe Defense Force Law states that the Minister of Defense will command the Japan Coast Guard in the emergency. <coughs> this ambiguity had been a factor that hinders the close cooperation between the JMSDF and the Japan Coast Guard. In the National security strategy prepared at the end of last year. The coordination and the cooperation between Japan Coast Guard and the Japan Self Defense Force will be consistently strengthened, including the Minister of Defense's control over the JCG in the even of the emergency, the event of the emergency. According to recent newspaper reports, a specific draft control procedure has been prepared. Uh, next, uh, I will explain JMSDF activity in the South China Sea. The US Navy is conducting the freedom of nav navigation operation in the South China Sea. The Japan Maritime Self-Defense Force has not announced that it will participate in, the, in this operation. <laughs> but it is efficient effectively working with the U.S. Navy to maintain maritime order based on anchors. <laughs> it's typically activity is several destroyer led by JS Izumo, carrier type destroyer have been de deployed in the Indo-Pacific region over a long period of time. This operation has been carried out every year since 18, uh, 2018. The name of the operation is Indo-South Asia, Southeast Asia Deployment. Its purpose is clearly defined as contribution of the, the um, contribution to regional peace and stability and promotion of mutual, mutual understanding and enhancement of trust with each country. Uh, last year, uh, three destroyers, including the JS Ismo, carry carrier type destroyer, participated in the four months deployment from June. This time, they conducted the joint exercise not only between the US Navy, but also with Australian, South Korean, and so on that supported the maritime order based on anchors. In addition, this operation has a large role of power projection. Uh, the Maritime Safety Defense Force has been conducting this activity for many years, for many years. The main purpose of this activity is to maintain the maritime order based on anchors. If China is trying to change the maritime order to suit its needs by gradually changing the regional environment, as Professor suggested, uh, the US and Japanese Navy need to work together more strategically. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to both of you. Um, I'm going to take my prerogative as the moderator to ask the first question, and I will open it up uh, to the floor for questions. Um, so what I hear from both of you is that uh, increasingly in maritime East Asia and also including in South China Sea, um, UNCLOS's role is diminishing in the wake of assertions of actual hard power. Um, I'm curious, uh, two questions, right? One is um, from China's standpoint, to what end? And then from those who are seeking to preserve the current order as defined under UNCLOS, what types of counter use of actual maritime power could be effective in terms of preserving or perhaps moving us back towards using UNCLOS as defined rules? Or do you view that that time has already passed because we missed the opportunity to do so in the 2010s? So I, I'll, I'll take a, a stab at that uh, very thought provoking question and I'll, I won't be able to do it justice on the fly because I think it ends up being quite a substantial policy question and it, and it's a it's a hard one uh but i i'm moving from admiring the problem to trying to come up with solutions so i welcome the chance to to talk about it so i guess the first thing and i know you're not you don't want to uh criticize the question but i guess what i would say is i don't necessarily see unclose diminishing in the face of china's power i think it's becoming less effective so i guess that's that's fair to think of that as diminishing, but in some ways, and this relates to what it is that the U.S. and allies and partners are doing, it's become more important. It's become more central to, it's become a proxy for some U.S.-China great power competitive mm -hmm. struggle. And so I think it has become less effective in actually describing the map of Maritime East Asia, the zones that you're supposed to get under UNCLOSE. This is the treaty that was China ratified in 1996. Uh, the rules that they affirm don't really apply to the rest of the region. That's what I mean by less effective. Mm -hmm. And yet we see the first use of the arbitral mechanism in the Law of the Sea Treaty uh, used against China in a period when people were talking about, who, you know, there's sort of a who, it's not who lost China yet, but it's certainly who lost the South China Sea is part of the discussion. And that's one of the, the kind of punctuation marks in it is that the Philippines lodged a suit, China outright rejected it. They issued four no's that seemed quite redundant, but effectively they said, this is not legitimate. We're upholding the law of the sea. This is what the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs wrote in its non-submission, non-paper to the tribunal that considered this. Uh, and, you know, the upshot of that is if you're Vietnam or if you're another state in the region that has a claim that you think China is obviously uh, violating your rights under the law of the sea, you have a different set of calculations about how effective that's likely to be. It's not as though the Philippines cashed out on an award that was very favorable to them. It basically created a permanent source of legal tension between them and China in some ways. And I, I for one, am quite a supporter of the Philippines arbitration, and I'm a believer that it can play an important role of some of the things that can be done from the U.S. standpoint on this, so let me just let me just say briefly to what end for China. I think that's an it's an again it's an interesting way of posing it. In some way, I think it's incidental for China because of the the intensity of their interests in their near maritime approaches. The law is effectively a casualty of that. They have an interest in not being on the outside of the international rules-based order such as it is. They don't have an interest in being perceived as a scoff law. They don't have an interest in overturning it. Again, they're deep, deeply participatory in all the law of the sea institutional mechanisms to include this big new treaty that was signed just last month, the High Seas Treaty, governing all this stuff far away from Chinese sovereignty, which I'm starting to study and, and uh, I'm quite interested in, in, in extending to this discussion beyond China's law of the sea and into the overall regime. But for now, basically for China, and I think the, the arbitration really catalyzed this, it basically said there is a contradiction here that we're not going to resolve. 
China's interests, our maritime interests, dictate that we need to have these maritime rights and interests. We're not going to be in the business. And for China, it was very clear. And some of the ways they attacked ad hominem, the judges illustrated this. They accused the Japanese president of the court of rigging the tribunal. They did a lot of things that are just not cricket from the standpoint of international law, but it was because political decision completely washed out anything that I was hearing at the time from the Chinese law of the sea community. It's worth noting, this was quite upsetting to anybody who's invested their life in studying or understanding the law of the sea because it, this was often misconstrued. The Philippines launched quite a clever suit and it was well within the scope of the law of the sea treaty. That was their goal. They had to keep it away from these historic issues, these sovereignty issues that China is inevitably going to view them through. But by any account, they did. And it basically presented China with this problem, which is we're going to have to do something that's not good for our overall policy, but that serves a broader interest. So as to what the U.S. can do, just briefly, I think that that arbitral award is one artifact of a longer process that can be used to basically knit together the region. And it's really fortunate that we have uh, voices from the region talking about this, because as, as the Admiral pointed out, one of the, the clearest uh, illustrations of the U.S. interest in this region, and perhaps in some ways our sole focus in a lot of this has been U.S. military navigation in the air for, for very sound naval operational reasons. But I think at a strategic level, if what we want is to maintain American, uh, maintain peace and stability in the Western Pacific as a first order uh, concern, maintain American access economically, which we view as being related to our military access. We need to think about the interests of regional states. One set of interests that's really quite clear and that I think the award becomes part of the case for is these states are all entitled, that's the word they use in the law of the sea, entitled to various sovereign rights over resources to include fisheries and seabed. Seabed resources, oil and gas, aren't even a drop in a barrel, in the barrel for China, which is doing offshore oil and gas projects at huge scale, mostly not in disputed waters, basically just in their near uh, areas off, off the Pearl River Delta and elsewhere near Hainan. But for Vietnam, for the Philippines, for all this, the littoral states in the South China Sea in particular, these are vital, vital economic resources. These are huge proportions of their potential, essentially foregone gross domestic product. One of the things that I get into in the book is that China is not effectively claiming resource rights that anybody's acknowledging, but what they've achieved is a kind of veto jurisdiction, I call it. Nobody's exploiting the resources in this part of the South China Sea, which is just, it's preposterously far from any basis for a Chinese claim. And yet, Chinese Coast Guard and fisheries law enforcement are out there making it such that the Japanese firms and the Russian firms and the Spanish firms and the American firms who've contracted with Vietnam to develop these oil and gas blocks just don't do it. It's just not worth it. They're starting to in small ways here and there. So that's what I would say is talk, think about the regional interests. Think about their actual concrete, honest to goodness, specific interests in this. And I think we could, we could have a much stronger voice on these are the rules. We need to agree that if you've got an exclusive economic zone, you have exclusive economic rights. Uh, thank you. I, I'm not an uh, expert of the international law, so uh, I I didn't uh, doubt the uh, wish. We uh, I didn't doubt the uh, Anglos should do, to change. So uh, uh, our government will ratify to the. Uh, and cross. So our oper our operation and uh, navigation should should to conducted should conduct should be conducted based on the uncross. So no doubt. So uh, but uh, uh, your books uh, uh, stated uh, uh, China changed the uncross the but by using the. Uh, Strategic environment in the South China Sea. So uh, I I not, noticed the uh, Philippine case. So you are also you mentioned uh, all, almost 2016 or 17. The uh, Philippines could have a primacy uh, about on the uh, territorial dispute between China and the Philippines. So at that time, Philippines. 
does not use that uh, primacy to solve the uh, in integrity dispute, so to use the uh, progress the economy. So it is a, a very difficult problem for drugs that uh, low, low, I think. Right, so we'll open the floor up to questions. Again, please identify yourself. I'm having a course teaching at the Department of East Asian and Asian Studies, and if you put a talk, um, I have a question on, I mean, um, you just brought up the Philippines, for instance, are uh, they get gains and so on. They get so they get so completely in my own personal view. First of all, I'm going to make those gains against kind of the basic territory of coordinated between uh, the countries, or kind of basically every country is playing on its own, and uh, which may not be those. In this, um, with the state of base there, and not the related question, um, the Republic of China was only um, speaking to China claim. I was kind of just party interested, and I mean, it was the KMT government that was 9 9, which was kind of the main party, but I mean, it was situated for the um. Well, both really, really interesting questions. So on the, you you are exactly correct that part of the reason this map is so complicated is because there are also bilateral and multilateral disputes involving other claimants in the South China Sea. The East China Sea and the Yellow Sea are actually somewhat more straightforward in that way. But Vietnam actually has... Uh, and Vietnam has the, I guess I would say, the third most expansive set of claims behind only the PRC and the ROC, So I'll get to in terms of claiming sovereignty over all the islands in the South China Sea, which Vietnam effectively does, and claiming some, you know, a, a long uh, littoral area of exclusive economic zone and continental shelf. There has been somewhat more cooperation between the various Southeast Asian states in terms of resolving some parts of their boundaries. I said China has none of its boundaries resolved. And if we put on this map, some of the Vietnam, Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, uh, Philippines, Malaysia has some, but there's still a challenge. It's worth noting that by the best estimate, only around half of potential maritime boundaries in the world are resolved. So China is, a, is quite an outlier, but it's also not the case that you should expect them all to be resolved. The law of the sea, especially this new treaty, that just came into effect in 1994 creates huge zones that have inevitably created ambiguity. And so the Southeast Asians have not figured out how to do this themselves in part because China confounds all of that, the possibility of them negotiating. It's almost as though it's not worth it because China's claiming all of it. And so they sustain the disputes. Admiral Mike McDevitt, a uh, retired uh, US Navy uh, Rear Admiral, who used to be the director and the joint staff for policy and plans, has a good policy and plan for this, which is that the U.S. needs to work really hard to get those states to resolve what they think the boundaries ought to be. And in some ways, those states, I think, independently, without U.S. prodding, have done things like that. And I guess I'll, I'll point to one if you want to get in the weeds on it. Vietnam and Malaysia submitted in 2009 just before the Chinese submitted their nine dash line, and arguably it was the impetus for it being published then at least, saying, basically delimiting what they thought their continental shelf boundary should be here in the southwestern part of the South China Sea. What they didn't say, but what they did in it was just projected the zone from the mainland. They gave no effect, no notice really to this bunch of islands that are kind of uh, drawn around with this this uh, tentative set of baselines here, uh, as well as the parasols that Vietnam claims sovereignty to and is used to have people living on and, and using, they basically just said, forget all that, in part because of the narrowness of this space, those tiny islands shouldn't have much effect. They're going to be going against, you know, intuitively, the, going against the big mainland with a tiny little speck. That's not going to rate equal zones. So what they did was basically say, 
we can put our sovereignty disputes aside altogether because they're irrelevant to the boundary. China emphatically rejects that. They say the sovereignty is the essential piece of it. And we, we're going to project our boundaries and our rights on the basis of a couple of things, one of which is sovereignty over these various disputed islands. So on to Taiwan, which is quite related. So the Republic of China, you're quite right, was the original author of the famous uh, dashed line map in the South China Sea. It actually, the, the original ROC document started getting developed in the 30s, and it was called the location map of the islands in the South China Sea. And effectively, that is what the ROC policy has always been. And Ma Ying Zhou, the former president, who is incidentally a Harvard Law JSD, who studied the law of the sea and East China Sea oil and gas development, his dissertation, which you can download and read, and I did years ago. Uh, but at any rate, he clarified this, and he knows the law of the sea better than any head of state, I believe, in history, probably. He didn't say it outright, but what he said was something just like what the, the Vietnamese and the Malaysians accomplished in their joint submission, which was the map was always a claim to sovereignty over the islands. It just The map was called the islands of the South China Sea. It never meant anything about maritime rights. And in fact, in Chinese practice, you can see some very clear illustrations of this. In 1958, they declared a territorial sea and said that it was separated from the islands, these islands, by high seas. There was no implication that there was any maritime rights. So the ROC toyed with, but then I would say kind of informally discarded the idea that they should have a parallel, very extreme claim on what, you know, basically saying that this new law of the sea treaty doesn't affect our historical rights. What I hear the Admiral saying, as someone who's not specializing in the law of the sea, but is, is operating in this space, it's just like, this was the agreed set of rules that everybody ratified to provide order in this domain, to allow you to draw boundaries, to allow you to know navigationally what's going to be okay and what's not. And it provides this focal point for it. Taiwan is in a very strange position on this because they don't want to abandon their claims for, for reasons that I guess we could discuss in more detail. Uh, they also want to be dragged into the PRC's quagmire in this in any way, but they they played a very interesting role in the arbitration. They were hopping mad that they weren't allowed to formally participate. Understandably, it implicated their maritime rights and interests and their sovereignty claims. And the Taiwanese China Society of International Law submitted an amicus brief to the arbitral panel that they accepted and, and discussed in their award, asserting that this island, Itu Aba, where is it? Uh, I didn't put it on here, but it's down here in the in the Spratleys. It's the one Spratly I was able to go to because the Taiwanese government administers it, and they've got scientific stations there and a little Coast Guard station, and they're growing squash, and uh, there's a little well. Uh, but at any rate, they came up with this whole couple hundred page brief asserting that this should be an island, uh, effectively supporting the PRC on the narrow piece of the award that they thought really implicated their interests. So Taiwan remains, I mean, I don't want to get too deep into the Taiwan question now, other than to say they basically share the Chinese claims. When you talk to the PRC, they say, our claims are a, are a legacy, is the way one uh, senior official put it to me. They're the legacy, or they're the inheritance, would be another way to translate it, the inheritance of the Republic of China. And we we embrace that historical kind of vintage of it. It, it makes it authoritative rather than the law from their standpoint. <clears throat> Thanks, Isaac. Thanks, uh, Kira-san, for being here. Uh, my, my question is to both of you. What do you have noticed that in February 2023 uh, this year, uh, there's been a area of uh, damage? And it's, it's actually the, uh, the, the fiber optic cable used uh, communication as well as the major U.S. tech firms such as uh, Meta, they use the the, the fiber optic cable to connect to a data center onshore to Taiwan and then to the United States. So I wonder if you follow this case and um, and there's a host of uh, uh, militia activities that's going on around that region, uh, especially targeted to. Uh, uh, sabotage the uh, critical infrastructure uh, that would 
uh, jeopardize the uh, global uh, internet communication. So I wonder what are some of the uh, potential mechanisms that can be put in place to prevent this from further um, deteriorating as it's been compromised and the, uh, um, the fiber optic cable has not been repaired mm. so as we speak right now. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, uh, Jason, I'm a fellow at the Irish Center here at Japan. Hi, Jason. I, I am familiar with the case, but I haven't followed it closely. But I'd actually defer to the Admiral here about what you can do about that. Uh, and I'll say briefly why, which is even the Chinese don't think the rule permits you to cut cables or sabotage cables. Even the Russians, who kind of did, did it brazenly, don't believe that that should be the rule. It ends up just being a question of discretion and prudence. Uh, what are the conditions under which they would want to do that? And in China's case, it seems clear it's one of many things that they are doing to coerce and harm Taiwan to, to, to uh, uh, I suppose, ad advance other policy objectives. But ultimately, it's a question of what do you do to deter China or other actors from doing things like that? And I may ask the Admiral to comment. What, would we, what do we do about cable uh, sabotage submarine? <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Maybe uh, submarine cable communication is uh, very important uh, rather than the satellite communication uh, as well as the satellite communication from now. Mm -hmm. So we have no capability to maintain and uh, uh, defense the submarine cable. So, but from now, we should develop the technology to the defend and uh, 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 replacement uh, uh, communication system, so satellite and under cable and another uh, tool, uh, we sh should uh, repair, I think. So maybe our government uh, will uh, uh, introduce that these kind of the technologies development framework. Like a US, Japan, Huawei type firm. <laughs> <laughs> Huawei submarine, I think is probably the one that uh, people are most familiar with. And I guess it's worth just tacking onto this. China has invested in this maritime power story very heavily in stuff like this. That's part of the blue economy. These are maritime industrial technologies that require things like deep seabed engineering capacity and all sorts of things that are quite costly, take a long time to develop, and that China, it's not the world leader in all of them. In fact, I suspect Japan probably leads in a lot of these fields technically, but just doesn't do it at quite the scale that China does. And I think we have a problem with just the home field advantage in that regard. Just the last thing to say on this, which is part of what China's done is developed a lot more maritime domain awareness, they call it, to include probably lots of autonomous sensors floating around, things in the seabed, things elsewhere, such that they're going to be much more aware for the most part, and we're working to remedy that with allies and partners, much more aware of a lot of this stuff going on and can more easily do things that are disruptive, like, like damage a submarine cable. I, I just wonder if you could comment on um, the island building uh, since uh, 2015 that's taken place. And, you know, now there are, you know, there are sort of symptoms of sea moves and And in terms of the, you know, Chinese claims uh, and sovereignty that may be the case, um, whether, again, in the long run, we expect this to, to continue and, you know, to increase its presence. Its ability, China's ability to have presence, everything, also our ships, ships, uh, ship fishing boats. Yeah. Um, yeah, though, I think that island building campaign, which I think started in earnest around 2013 and came up to the president to president level or president to general secretary level in 2015, when Xi Jinping told Obama in the Rose Garden that they wouldn't, quote, militarize the Spratly Islands, that's what he said, I believe. Uh, by any measure, they're quite militarized, and they were then too. So there's a 
there's a longer discussion about what what is intending to signal there but those stand out as you know one of the the main uh you know the most concrete example literally of china's defiance of of certain of the rules that uh you know most states i think would would uh tend to agree are are pretty are pretty obvious things like if you build something like mischief reef that was never above the surface of the water never had any basis under the law of the sea to generate zones to generate rights because it's not you know, the law of the sea is about assigning rights to states with you know, it's people in them that use the economic resources of the sea. It's basically what it's about. But here, what we have is now quite a capable military base. It's worth noting these are uh, mischief. The lagoon there is bigger than than Pearl Harbor. It's a big base. There are no Navy ships or Navy aircraft deployed there, but maybe there are now. I haven't checked in the last hour. It's not. It's a, it's it's set up for exactly that, as you said, and their surface to air missiles and their radars. And there's actually quite a lot more stuff that I think is non-military, but quite important to the story that I want to tell here, which is that these are part of China's ability to administer this area and to treat these zones like they're really its exclusive economic zone. And when we see all these episodes of Chinese fishermen swarming around Philippine uh, uh, reefs, claimed reefs or vessels or interfering things, the reason they're able to do that is because especially when they're down in the Southwest part, they go to Fiery Cross Reef. When they're here in the Reef Bank, they go to uh, Mischief for Subi and they've been able to use these safe harbors and the resources and the, you know, if it's Coast Guard ships, you can swap personnel, you can refuel, you can refit. This has created, and I, I, I would like to ask the Admiral his sense of the strategic or the operational significance. To me, the military side, it's there. It's latent. It's the way I was describing the PLA Navy operating in a lot of this. Its power is, it's latent. It's there. They can use it to project power, but it's actual functional use now. And I think in perpetuity, if they can, is to be a base for China's expressions of its sovereignty in this space, its administration of the zone. Yes, I don't, uh, military point of view. So, uh, if the even if the Chinese government uh, uh, expressed uh, this uh, artificial island for use of uh, civil uh, civil uh, airport and civil air traffic control, but the military point, uh, uh, you uh, Chinese government to aim to the get into uh, air superiority. So uh, military operation need that air superiority and the sub 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 surface superiority. So this kind of the uh, artificial iron the, by using the get the getting the uh, superiority. All right, we have time for one last question, Bill. The hang arbitration rule the Italo wasn't substantial enough to be an island with the, the rock, uh, but it's bigger than the San Kaku. Then one to treat the San Kaku island, islands. Um, how do how do we uh, reconcile that and manage it? So I, I'll, I'll start, but I'll, I will I will certainly de defer to you on on the Japanese strategy with respect to the Sakakus. But I, you are right that the arbitration, and I would I want to offer a, a public service announcement. To call, it, it's a law of the sea arbitration. It was held in the Hague at the permanent court of arbitration, but that was just the registry. They just provided the office space basically, uh, and the you know the the organization, but the legal mechanism was the law of the sea annex seven arbitration it's an ad hoc arbitration so they formed a panel under the law of the sea under the president of the international tribunal of the law of the sea who was a japanese judge at the time um the tribunal did rule that none of the features 
in the whole of the dispute between the Philippines and China, which is to say the Spratleys or most of the Spratleys, they actually, the scope of the cases is, is what it is. It doesn't bear on anything else. But the part of the Spratleys that the, the Philippines claims includes Ituaba or uh, Taiping Dao is the, the, the Chinese name for it. Um, but size is <laughs> size matters, but it's actually not determinate in any way. The test from the law of the sea such as it is, it's a little indeterminate, but it's that they need to be capable of sustaining human habitation and economic life of their own. And this gets, there's quite a lot of parsing of what that means in the award. And I'd, I'd encourage you to read it if you're interested in this, but you can make a perfectly reasonable case that the Senkakus fit those categories. That the Senkakus have been used for various economic purposes. And I think people have lived there over the years. And that was one of the ways that the arbitrators thought about how to apply this rule because the the reality is, and this is kind of a broader point, maybe a good one to end on, is that even though there's a treaty called the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, as Chinese lawyers will be very insistent on pointing out, that is not the whole of the law of the sea by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, there is a huge customary body of law and rules to include things that are not law of the sea that bear very directly on it especially customary rules about sovereignty of possession and acquisition of, of territory, which comes into play in the Sakaku. So we can we can discuss that in depth later. I want to make sure I give uh, uh, Admiral Ikeda a chance to speak. Yes. Uh, Japanese government, officially, we have no, uh, we, we don't have a, a territory, uh, dis, a territory dispute. Uh, in so, but, uh, uh, our Coast Guard and uh, our uh, maritime safety defense force conducting is conduct uh, conducting the uh, operation around the center of Ireland, as I mentioned uh, previously. So uh, this op operation continued uh, for more ten, 10 years. So I said the, these kind of com operation will continue to uh, more than one hundred years. Hmm. Well, um, I think uh, both of you have given us a lot to think about. Uh, we certainly uh, have come away with a deeper appreciation of the flashpoints uh, that uh, confront all of us uh, in uh, maritime uh, East Asia in the South China Sea. Uh, but I think you've also given us a lot of food for thought about the different instruments that can be deployed, whether it's law, maritime power, but also the commercial fleets and so forth. And uh, this certainly uh, embodies what this series is all about, um, probing deeply into one of the critical issues confronting China and China's relationship with the world. Uh, so thank you, uh, Isaac. Thank you, uh, Admiral. Uh, please join me in a round of applause. Uh, for uh, this. And uh, also, uh, thank you again to everyone who's been involved uh, with this series for this academic year. Thank you all. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Are you able to join us for lunch? Yes. Okay, good. Speak then.